We are still in chapter six, mission number six of Pirkei Avos, the 48 ways to wisdom. We're nearing the end, and today we're going to do actually two ways to wisdom, way number 44 and way number 45. 44 is halomed al-melas al-melas If someone who, um, way 44 is halomed al-menas lalamed, studying with the intention of teaching. And way number 45 is lo made almanas laasos, studying with the intention of observing, of performing. These, our sages tell us, if, if someone studies and their intent, their focus, their motivation is to teach, that is a higher level of studying. And that study is empowered. And that's one of the ways to acquire more Torah, more wisdom. And if someone studies with the intention of observing, you want to know what to do. You want to follow the instructions. You want to implement what you are studying. That too is a heightened, a a powered, a empowered for, form of studying, and that too is another way to wisdom. So let's uh, let's so let's analyze these ways to wisdom, starting with. Way number 44, Halomed al-Menas Lelamed, someone who studies with the intention of teaching. When you study Torah, you can study it just to study it, and that's great. But there's a different way of studying. I want to study so I know it, but also so, so I could transmit it onwards. I could teach it to others. That is a way to study more your Knowledge, your acquisition of Torah will be augmented when you study in this fashion with the intention of teaching. Now, we know, of course, teaching Torah, it's a necessary part of our nation. The only way that our people can have continuity, our sacred mission can endure, it's only if we maintain this incredible body of wisdom, this incredible corpus of knowledge, it's only if we perpetuate the Torah onward. If, God forbid, there were to be a generation where the Jews opt out, they're working on their degree, they're taking some time to go visit Europe, they're doing other things, and they're not dedicating themselves to teaching Torah, if there's one link in the chain that's missing, it's all over. So, of course, it's always been an imperative of our people, an obsession of our people, a pastime of our people to study, but also to teach. And here we're told that studying with the intention of teaching, that's a much more powerful way of studying. And that form of studying is in itself a means to acquire Torah. Now, why is it so important to teach? Of course, is that you have continuity. We'll talk more about that in a bit. But on a most basic level, who was the first teacher of Torah? Some may say, some may say that, well, that, that's Moshe. But the truth is, the first teacher of Torah is the Almighty. Hashem taught the Torah to Moshe. And that was the first instance of teaching of Torah. And thus, when we teach Torah, we are, in effect, emulating God. We have in our morning prayers the blessings for the Torah. And we say, God is the teacher of Torah to his nation, Israel. So it's, it's, it's a way of, of thinking about this. Not, you're not just a teacher. You are doing something, something so sacred and imperative, but also something that is mimicking God on some level, emulating God. And when we look at our history, we find that this objective of teaching Torah to the next generation has always been front and center for our people and for our antecedents. You recall perhaps before the downfall of Sodom and Gomorrah. So Abraham has the travelers and the really angels masquerading as wary travelers that come to visit him. We know that story, chapter 18 of Genesis. But then they leave and they're going to Sodom and Gomorrah to destroy the city. 
and we read a few very curious verses. This is chapter 18 of Genesis, verses 17 through 19. God says, am I going to conceal from Abraham that that I intend to do? God is dispatching these, these angels to go to Sodom and to destroy it. Abraham is oblivious of this. And God says, so to speak, how can I withhold this plan of mine from Abraham? Abraham, after all, he's going to become a father of a great nation. And all the other nations will only receive the blessing through him. And then we have verse 19. So this is 18, 19. For I know, God says, that Abraham, he will instruct his children and his household after, after him to guard and observe the way of God. Abraham is special. He is distinct. Not just because he's a believer, but because he's a believer who is dedicated towards the taking of, of, of the idea of monotheism and making a movement and a nation out of it and perpetuating, perpetuating it onward. And that's why God is saying to Abraham, I'm going to, oh, regarding Abraham, I'm going to reveal my plans to him because he's not just content with studying, with knowing, with having a deep relationship with the Almighty himself, but he's going to pass that onward. And therefore, I want to give him more insight into my plans. This is kind of the idea of our Mishnah. When someone says, I want to have knowledge of God, but I don't want to just harbor it myself, I want to pass it onwards. We have a precedent. God says about Abraham, you do that, therefore I'm going to give you more of my insight. Similarly, in our Mishnah, if someone intends on teaching, God says, okay, I'm going to give you more wisdom. I'm going to augment and empower that teaching. But truthfully, it's not just Abraham. Every single sage, every single hero of our history was also a sage and was also a teacher. The idea of someone amassing an immense amount of knowledge and just harboring it for themselves, that is anathema. Studying, of course, is critical. But to bear Torah means that it must be passed onward to others. And the Maharal in his comment on this Mishnah, he says that really the individual is not worthy of Torah. Who received the Torah? A nation received Torah. No individuals. A single person, a single discreet individual, no matter how great they are, are not worthy of bearing the Almighty's holy Torah. The essence of Torah being given to the people, to the nation, is that it's given to a mass of people. And thus, no individual has a claim to be a bearer, to be a, a standard bearer, a torch bearer of, of the Torah on their own. There's a mandate for all to pass it onward. That's what the Almighty did. That's what Moshe did. That's what Abraham did. And that's what all of our antecedents did throughout the ages. And then he adds something interesting. How is a person supposed to teach? He cites the Talmud. The Talmud in the book of Nedarim says, quotes a verse in Devarim. The verse says, Behold, you should see that I have taught you Torah. And the Talmud deduces from this that when we teach Torah, it should be modeled after the way God taught Torah. And did God charge tuition? Was there a fee for entry? No, there wasn't. And therefore the Talmud says that our teaching must be modeled after God's teaching, and therefore we too cannot charge a tuition for our teaching. Which is why in some yeshivos, they don't charge tuition because of this halacha. How could you charge for teaching the Maiz Torah? You're privileged to, to, to have a little bit of the Maiz Torah for the sole purpose of 
teaching others. Of course, observing, but teaching others as well. How can you say, I'm going to charge you a stipend? I'm going to charge you a fee for teaching. But here's the problem. The yeshiva needs the tuition. <laughs> so they came up with a genius workaround. They said, no, 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 we're not, we're not charging you for, for, for the teaching. We're charging you for the merit of the Torah study. Because if we don't charge, we get to keep all the merit for ourselves. You wouldn't want that, of course not. Of course not. Therefore, you want to you have the merit of your, of your, of, of your Torah study? You've got to pay for that. But not the teaching. Teaching, that is, that is free. I do have a, a little pet peeve for people who put their Torah teaching behind a paywall. For this reason, the Almighty does not have a paywall for his teaching, and neither should we. That's why our model is always everything's from everything we do from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas, or wherever the Torch Center rabbis may be broadcasting from. It's always going to be free for this reason. We we want, of course, we need we need support. If someone wants to donate and support and partner, that's great. But we're never going to charge. That's our that's our policy, and that's the idea. One of the ideas we're seeing over here to teach. It is to channel, so to speak, godliness within yourself. God was the first teacher. He is called the teacher of Torah. We're told to teach because he taught, and we're told to teach in the same manner that he taught, namely, for free. So if teaching Torah is so important, when ought we to start? So this is an interesting question. Obviously, if you know nothing... You can't teach anything. What if you know a little bit? Should you wait until you have a much more robust knowledge base? Until you're an expert, you're a sage. Is there some sort of level, some sort of plateau that you must reach before you begin to transition to a teacher? And that is a, a matter of, of debate. Some of the sages argue if all you know is the letters of the alphabet, the Aleph base, if that's all you know, you learn Aleph, you study Aleph, you know Aleph, teach Aleph. You study base, the second letter, teach that. That's one stool of thought. A second stool of thought argues that that's not the ideal way to do it. You first should gain some basic knowledge. Of course, you have to learn how to read, understand, read the Torah, gain a foothold in the Mishnah, in the Talmud, and only then transition to teaching. And the analogy that you hear many times is if you have like a, a chalice, a goblet, a cup, and you start to pour wine inside the cup, and slowly the volume of, of the vessels being filled up, there comes a point in time where it's full, but you keep on pouring and it starts to spill over. That's the way it's supposed to be. You're always studying. You're always studying, always studying, always studying. But you study to a, such a point that it just spills out of you and you start teaching others almost as a byproduct, an indirect by, byproduct of, of studying is that there's just so much and it just begins to ooze out of you and it inevitably spills over to others. Different schools of thought. But as a matter of principle, everyone agrees that teaching is imperative. And in our mission, we're learning that if someone studies with the intention, with a desire of teaching, even if they don't teach, they're studying with the intention of teaching, that will unlock new portals. And part of the idea we've said is that this is a way to get divine assistance. We're not studying a discipline like other disciplines. This is not just, oh, a different realm, a different field of study than mathematics, science, history, art, whatever. This is divine wisdom. And therefore, you need to have some sort of merit to be worthy of being a vessel for divine wisdom. And if God sees in a person that they want to not only learn his word, but to spread it, to perpetuate, to be an ambassador for God, they're going to get extra divine aid. 
I told the story before. I say it again. It's my favorite story. You've heard it before. My grandfather of blessed memory, he was a voluminous writer. We have the, the amount of writing that he did just off the charts. And he was a very accomplished speaker. And the amount of lectures that he gave, thousands upon thousands. And he was a very developed thinker. He was, he was a real titan of Torah. And he had his yeshiva that he founded in 1948. And every single week he would give a lecture. And he never repeated himself. He didn't give the same lecture over. Every week was a brand new lecture. And often he would do a series, like 12 to 15 lectures on one general subject, where he develops an idea over the course of, of a semester, in effect. And then he would write it down. It would be like a whole treatise in one of his works. He published in his lifetime, like 15 books. And the amount of works left in manuscript form exceeds the amount of writings that he published in his lifetime. So all of us would agree this is a capable, competent, um, just a, a, a fountain of insight, a wellspring of wisdom. But once he was slated to speak in the yeshiva, and this was one of the highlights of the week, where the great rabbi would come and, and give the weekly lecture. But he felt like he was just hitting dead ends and whatever he was trying to develop, whatever ideas he was trying to develop and understand and hone, he was hitting dead ends. And he had nothing to say. And the, the clock was ticking because there was an appointed time where he was, he was scheduled to speak. And the time arrived and he had nothing to say. And he had no choice but to put on his frock coat, the rabbinic garb that he would wear, and his rabbinic hat, and march to the yeshiva. He's at the mercy of the Almighty. And when he arrived, something happened that never happened before and never happened afterwards. His partner in the yeshiva, yeshiva always has two heads, the, the mashkiach and the rosh yeshiva. So his partner came over to him and says, I have a very unusual request. My father-in-law is in town and he really wants to give a lecture to the students. Would it be okay just this week, just this week, would it be okay if he takes your slot? After all, you know, this is, this is the rabbi has a pulpit. You can't just remove him and put someone else in, without his permission. But would it be okay this week, just, just this week, he wants to speak to the students. And indeed, that week, the other rabbi came in and spoke for the students. And so it's such a powerful story because, you know, we we like to think if someone's capable and they're able to produce a lot and they're voluminous in their output, well, they're very talented, they're 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 brilliant, they're genius, they're they're, they're great, they're a great student, they got a really razor sharp mind but we often forget about God. And when it comes to Torah, the Almighty is the purveyor of Torah. He's the one who's made Torah, he's the one who teaches Torah. And thus, if you are meritorious and you're deserving, you're going to bear some of his Torah. And the Almighty can send a message to remind you every once in a while that it's ultimately him and it's not you. And if a person says, I want to know your Torah, and I want to teach it, I want to publicize and proliferate it, you are in effect saying, I'm a better candidate to be worthy of your Torah. And the man says, okay, you're interested? Here you go. So there's the divine aid element of this Mishnah. If someone wants to teach, God says, okay, you want to teach? I'm going to give you some more. But more directly, when you study, and you don't need to teach it. It's not on the test. You don't really have to know it well enough. 
you could kind of skim it. You could kind of glance over it, peruse it, give a cursory perusal of the material. You kind of get the gist. No one who walks into the trenches and faces all the uh, all the students and says, I'm going to teach and come at me with your questions. You can't just have a cursory perusal. You can't just have a like a vague understanding of some of the general contours of, of the material. Nothing forces you to know the material cold more than having to teach it and having to face questions, having to field challenges. You really have to understand it. And that forces you to have a totally different level of comprehension. To teach effectively, you have to take an idea and, and clarify it and maybe reword it, maybe explain it in a variety of ways on different dimensions. Find another way to rephrase it, to really understand the material, to know it well. And only then can you teach it. So if you study with intent of teaching, you're much more focused and you're in inevitably going to study it more intensely and your acquisition of the knowledge we will be more complete. In addition, I was thinking, teaching is a form of review. So I study some, some material, someone studies material, and, and they studied it, so they know it. And then they teach it, that's the second time that they're studying it. So that's a review. And thus, Teaching is, in effect, a way of having a built-in review system. And that, of course, reinforces the initial study, the initial acquisition. Now, one of the great advances in efficiency that I did in my life was I changed the way that I edit my podcasts. So how do you edit the podcast? You record the podcast, you got your microphone, you got your recorder set up, and you put in your uh, SD card, you hit record. But then, I don't know, you have to cough. So you, you can it's not fair to the listeners to hear your phlegmy cough in the podcast. So you have to edit that out, right? So you have to re-listen to it, listen to the whole file listen to the whole thing, and then you pick out the parts that maybe need to be edited and, and removed and so on. That's why I did it for years and years and years. But then I came up with a, a new efficient way to do it. I'm, I'm telling you my secrets here. As I record, I do simultaneous editing. Meaning, if I give a cough... I look at my uh, recording device that I have over here at my desk and I'll jot down on a piece of paper. I'll say, okay, at uh, 23 minutes and uh, 20 seconds into this podcast, I got to remove a cough and so on. And once I'm done, I just take that paper that has all the, the timestamps for what I need to edit and I edit it from, from the end of the file to the beginning. So you don't start from the beginning of the file, you start from the end. And the reason why you do that is because let's say you have 10 changes. So if you start from the beginning of the file, and you cut out from 1 minute to 1 minute and 10 seconds, that means that all the other timestamps are now 10 seconds off. Ah, clever, right? So you have to start from the end. You start from the end and you edit it backwards. But the net result of that is you don't ever listen to it again. It used to be that when I would edit the podcast, well, it's a second time to listen, to listen to what I actually had to say. It was a review. But now it's more efficient. But I do feel, I do sometimes miss the fact that I used to have to, I was forced to re-listen to, to the whole podcast before I would release it. It's more efficient but there is a downside. There are some drawbacks of this new updated method of, of editing. I'm still not going back. I'm not going back to that. But still, but still, when you teach, it's a form of review. And when you review, you know it. 
better. There's yet another idea that the commentaries tell us. The Talmud teaches us that, of course, we know that prayer, prayer works. You want something, you beseech God Almighty. He has everything that you want. You pray, and He will deliver. Sometimes He says no, but on a conceptual level, of course, we know that we want things, and the way we get what we want is, is with prayer. And you could pray for yourself. You could pray for other people as well. So the Talmud tells us that when a person prays not only for themselves, but they pray for other people as well, their prayer for themselves becomes more efficacious. Now, the canonical example of this is when, when Sarah was abducted by Avimelech. So God made a plague for all the people of Avimelech and all their orifices sealed up. And that, I gather, is quite unpleasant. And then Sarah prayed to have their orifices opened. And immediately afterwards, Sarah bears a child. Sarah becomes pregnant, and Isaac is born. And Thomas says, wait a minute, like the juxtaposition of these two stories, it's not a coincidence. Because Sarah has been praying for a child for a very long time, and that prayer is powerful. But it becomes even more powerful when she prays for someone else to have their orifices, so to speak, opened. So when she prays for someone, and, and she needs the, the, the same thing that they need, well, now her prayers become more powerful. That's the idea that the Talmud says in the book of, I think, Bab Metziah. Now, I, I will note, this teaching in the Talmud is a, often misrepresented. People think, well, you don't need to pray for yourself, just pray for others. You pray for others, well, then you'll get whatever you need. That's not what the Talmud says. It's not like, oh, I just pray for you and you pray for me, and it's just like a each one of us benefit each other. We don't need to pray for ourselves. You read the Talmud. The Talmud says, if you pray for others, then you will be answered first. Obviously, you're still praying for yourself. But your prayers become more potent when you pray for others. So the commentaries tell us that there's a similarity to that concept over here. When you're teaching others, what are you trying to do? You're trying to, you're trying to empower their knowledge. You want to increase their knowledge. If someone is dedicated towards making sure that others know more Torah, just as when someone is praying for others, their prayer becomes more powerful. When someone's trying to get others to study, their own studies become more powerful. Just as God will answer those who pray for others in their prayers, so too, God will endow wisdom to those who are dedicated towards the conveyance of wisdom to others. So that's way number 44, studying with the intention of teaching. And way number 45, that is halomid almanas laasos, studying with the intention of observing, of doing, of performing. When you study, you could study for conceptual, abstract reasons, nice ideas, stimulating things to ponder, to consider. Torah study is fascinating, it's intriguing, it's challenging. There are a great many reasons why someone would be motivated to study Torah. It's enthralling. It captivates your mind. And that's great. But a high level, even higher than studying with the intention of teaching, is studying with the intention of observing, of doing. When someone studies the Almighty's Torah and he uses that, he or she uses that as a model for how they ought to live, how they ought to design their life, how they ought to 
behave. That's taking the Imani's word seriously. And if someone is studying, but they're like studying just on a theoretical abstract level. And when it comes to their own private life, their own behavior, they'll, they'll just do what they've always done. Someone like that is studying with like a, a built-in resistance to the studies. So like they're studying, but they don't want too much of it because they don't want it to become obligatory for them. That form of study will not be absorbed more deeply or as deeply into their bones as when they're trying to say, I, I really want to open up myself to the Almighty's Torah. When there's active pushback, I, I want it, but not too much. That, of course, is a much less powerful form of study. And the commentaries tell us that this, of course, is, is true in matters that are actionable. You know, what are the laws? Let me, let me learn all the laws of Shabbos, for example. Okay, what do I need to do? And what must I refrain from doing? Those are matters that are directly actionable. The, 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 the law is telling you what you're supposed to do, what you're not supposed to do, and you have to follow the law. But even in other matters, you read a part of the Torah that doesn't seem to be directly actionable. We're told to always look out, to always seek some sort of practical takeaway from everything that we study. In the Ramban's famous letter to his son, the Yerusha Ramban, he writes, When you get up from the book, you should inspect, you should search in what you studied, if there's something that I can implement. Is there any way that I can translate this into action? Even if it doesn't seem to be directly actionable, all of Torah should have some way of entering, of, of integrating into your, into your life, into how you live, how you think, how you speak, and how you behave. And part of the, the, the last mile of study should be, okay, what can I do about this now? How can I implement it? And that is a totally different form of study. It's not abstract. It's not conceptual. It's not just nice ideas that float in the sky. It's real. It's how you live. And this, we're told, is even a higher level than way number 44. Way number 44 is with the intention of teaching, even higher than that is with the intention of observing. Earlier on in this book, Perke Avos, in chapter 4, we studied this in January of 2020. It's been some time. Our plan is to finish this book in 2024. Worry not. We've We've done a major push to try to fin finish the book. One of my friends told me, he's like, Rabbi, you started Pergavos in 2017? It's time. Let's wrap it up. <laughs> so we're working really hard to finish this in 2024. But back in 2020, in chapter 4, mission number 6, we read, Halo made Torah amanas lalamed. If someone studies Torah with the intention of teaching, then he will be aided from above and will be enabled to teach and to study. His wishes will be granted. But if someone studies with the intention of, of doing, then he'll be aided from above. Lilmod ulalamed lishmar velasos. He'll be able to study and teach and guard and observe. So studying with the intention of teaching is great, but even a higher level is the intention of observing. And on a basic idea, that, that means that someone who wants to do something, they'll be granted 
the ability to do it. So if you want to study to teach, you'll be able to study to teach. You want to study to do, you want to study to do. Well, how, how, well, well, how do you do it? You do it to, to, to actually live a life that you're implementing the Torah. It means to, to study and to teach and to guard and to observe. But the commentaries invoke an incredible teaching in the Talmud. It talks about the descendants of Eli. You remember Eli? He was the teacher of Samuel, the high priest. And his descendants were cursed with living a short life. They were all die young. And the Talmud tells us that there, there are two people, people that we know of who managed to overcome this curse. Two of the most famous sages in the Talmud are descendants of Eli. One's name is Rabbah and one's name is Abaya. Now, if those names don't sound familiar, that is proof you haven't studied a lot of Talmud. Because in every page of Talmud, you read about about Rava and Rabba, not to get them confused, but Rabba and Abaya are, are two of the top five most frequently named sages in the Talmud. And the Talmud says that they both managed to live relatively long lives. All the descendants would die at the age of 20, at the age of 18, very young. But Rabba, he lived to 40. And Abaya, he lived to 60. So they lived, they lived relatively longer lives. And the Talmud says, well, why did these two sages, why did they outlive their life expectancy as descendants of Eli? The Talmud tells us that Rabbah, he studied Torah. And because he studied Torah, he got long life. Abaya. He did more than that. He studied Torah and he dedicated himself to kindness and benevolence. And therefore he lived not only 40, he lived to 60. And the commentaries tell us, what does it mean to study Torah with the intention of teaching versus studying Torah with the intention of doing? Studying Torah with the intention of teaching it's all about the Torah. You, you want to study it, and you want to teach it. And you're not necessarily thinking about how to be someone who's an exemplar of kindness and benevolence. Someone like that, they are given the ability to do what they want to do. Rabbah, who, who studied Torah with the intention of teaching, he lived to 40 years old, and he did what he needed to do. Studying Torah with the intention of doing, it means to dedicate your life for other people. To dedicate your life for kindness and benevolence. And to study Torah in a manner that you'll be empowered through that to live a life dedicated for another person, for others. And that's what Abaya did. And as a result of that, he not only lived a long life, but he was granted the ability to do what he wanted to do. We, of course, were very privileged. We think about what Abraham had to do. Abraham, he went to study Torah, and it was not accessible to him at all. He had to work really hard to get any bit of Torah, any bit of divine direction. We have it easy for us. It's available on the internet. It's in English. Hundred years ago, he tried to go try studying Torah in English. Good luck. You have the Talmud, the Mishnah. Everything's in English. Almost everything. Some of the stuff are, some of the good stuff are, are still only Hebrew or Aramaic. Good luck with that. How's your Aramaic? I could brush up a little bit on it. The Torah is available for us. But we still need to do whatever we can to become worthy of it. And our Sages is telling us here, as we approach the end of the 48 ways to acquire Torah, 
There are, there are motivations that we can try to internalize in our studies to study, not just to have it myself, but to teach it onward. That's that's a, a, a cheat code to acquire the Mayas Torah. And to think about all sorts of ways that I can implement it into my behavior, to my daily life. And how I can use it to become a trans, transformed person. To become someone who's dedicated to other people, whose kindness becomes a very high priority in someone's life. Those are ways to just catapult to a higher level of connection with the Almighty and His Torah. May we all be so fortunate to study the Almighty's Torah, to teach it, and to observe it. Ways number 44 and 45, studying Torah with the intention of teaching and studying Torah with the intention of observing. My email address is rabbiwalbajima.com, currently in Canada, in Toronto, Ontario, but the internet still works here on occasion. Not as, not as good as it is in the United States. Okay. Send me an email. I look forward to your questions, your comments, and your feedback.